Let's get to it, shall we? Repeat with me, please. Say, trapped by injustice. I am convinced that there are times in life when things are not fair. Uh, you know, this is the week of Valentine's love. And uh, so some of you are going to get a little card. You're going to get a little, a little heart, you know. And some of you ain't going to get nothing. And some of you are not going to give anything either, you know. I told Diane for years, I'm your Valentine's every year. And uh, I used to go buy them expensive flowers. I mean, really expensive flowers. Really expensive. Um, no, they just no roses. I used to go get the bad ones. What are they? Don't ask me. You don't want to know. And I did it, and after a while, she just told me I can give her the money. Uh, <laughs> I know you love me, you know. And, and, uh, but we, so I, I know how this season is. There's a lot going on. And some of you feel that you, you've been un, in, there's some injustice in your love life. And so I'm going to answer, before I get jumped in here too far, I'm going I'm to answer a couple love questions because it's the right thing to do since it's the season. Uh, People ask me sometimes, so how do you find and build a love relationship that lifts you and does not trap you? How do you do that? How do you find and build a love relationship that, that lifts you and doesn't trap you? I believe the love can trap you. You can, get, you can fall in love and lose yourself. First thing I say to people is be what you want someone to be to you. That's where you start. If I want somebody in my life to love me a certain way, I need to be that. Sow what you want to reap. And that's just simple. Love don't have to be complicated. It can be simple. Second question people ask me is, what if you are already in a relationship that feels like a trap? Pray. Uh, (laughs) And do these two things. You ready? Because it can be trapping. It can feel, and this is something you have to kind of be careful about, you know. Um, Sidebar here a little bit. I, I, my wife, you know, she's married to a pastor. She said she would never marry a pastor. And she said she would never marry, you know, she, but I came along. What could she do, right? <laughs> <laughs> Stay humble, preacher, right? Stay humble. But no, but they're, they're, to me, I'm always concerned, what's it like for the person when they're in a relationship with you? And my, my concern is that whenever it gets to a place where it's not good for everybody, you renegotiate, here's my answer, renegotiate the terms and the culture of the relationship. Sometimes you have to renegotiate it. I, I am not convinced that the way we've been taught in church or in religious environments is always fair. I, I think sometimes it's, it leans, the way we interpret, for example, submission and women should submit to their husbands and, and um I think that gets a little, I, I, a little bit out of, out of whack there because really that's said in the context of safety because you're loving her the way Christ loves the church. It's a lot easier to submit to you. You're fair. If it's not a safe environment, if you're threatening and loud and rude and in kind, kind, who wants to submit to you? It's not a fair environment. It's like on your job. If your boss yells at you and screams at you and it's unfair to you, who wants to go to work? And it can be the same way at home. So if a relationship has gotten to a place where it's uncomfortable, you have to renegotiate the terms. Sit down and say, okay, our culture has gotten a little bit out of whack. I'm doing all the housework you're not helping or whatever the deal may be. Or in some cases, uh, your life ambitions, somehow you now blame me because you haven't reached all your goals. I don't think that's fair. So renegotiate. And sometimes that's a hard thing to do, but I think it helps you. And I've had to do that with Diane. We've had to renegotiate as our kids have grown older and things have changed. So that's a thought. Um, Decide what you want to be and don't allow a relationship to change you. Don't give your strength to people that will turn your heart and priorities away from God and and, and your best interests. There is um, a lot I can say about that. There's more in the sermon notes. I put down Deuteronomy 7, 3, which talks about God's warning about who you fall in love with, how it can change your life. Some of you single people need to read that verse because it can turn you, they can turn your heart from God. I always tell people, when I, when I met you, I'm here, right? And now I'm where? Here? I should be here. When I meet you, I'm here. I should be here after a year or six months. Sometimes if we're not careful, we're pulling each other down. You know, sadness, misery, every day is a problem. 
I, I want to find a way to love um, so that when you're around me, it's better. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. That's my Valentine's advice. If you got somebody that say amen. amen. That's all y'all going to say? <laughs> Did you get somebody that, that helpful? Come on, say amen, right? Amen. Good stuff, I think. All right. Let's, let's pray. Father, I thank you for the rest of the message today, what we will talk about and how it will bless and help those who hear it. May it bless their minds and lift their hearts and spirits. Injustice is something that hurts all of us. I pray that we would open our hearts and minds to see and to hear and to grow and to learn. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. In our study, there are four areas that I promised you this month I would cover regarding injustice. Uh, and, I, and I talked about the importance of being fair and being honest with yourself. Last week, we talked about facing our true condition and how important it is that you have to face the truth about yourself. Our nation has to face the truth about itself. In this season, when you're celebrating Black History Month and you're going through all of these historical facts and all the things that happen, it can be difficult to face what we did and, what we did and the journey we took together. I always say it this way. We've had as a nation a painful journey. We have to admit that but we can have a bright future. We have great potential. No one's going to deny the power and the, and the ugliness of slavery, 246 years of it. That's how I remember it, 246. The challenges that went on from 1619 to 19 to 1865, all the things that I say, right, 18, when did slavery in? 18, 65, 85, which one was it? I'll tell you what, see, that's how the devil gets you. You get up here and your brain go dead. Can't think about nothing. And so you sit here and see one thing I'll tell you, I vowed in my life. I vowed that I would never forget when it ended. How about an amen to that? And I think um, for some reason, and this is one of my favorite things to remember, but because I'm imperfect, things happen. 1865, I'm right. And so I think there are moments when you, you find yourself trying to um, communicate how we got to where we are without sounding like you're stuck. And I, I believe that's important. So that's why I always say we've had a challenging journey together. Black, white, Asian, African, and all of us. We've had a challenging journey. We can, we can go back in history and find some really ugly things. And I'm sure in some of your marriages in life, in families, you can say that. You've had a challenging journey with your family, but you have to find a way forward. You can't stay where you used to be, or we will never go forward in life. There is a book that I recommended to you by um, Isabel Wilkerson that I thought was profound. It is a great book. It's called Cast, The Origin of Our Discontent. Uh, it is the book that I will be reviewing at the end of the month um, in, in our conversation. I hope you join my book club. Some of you said you would join, so this is your chance now. And I have another book for you next month. Will you have a book a month? Probably not, because I don't know if you're going to read that fast with me. But if you if you bad to roll with me, we'll see. OK, we'll keep rolling. But I love to read and I believe that reading helps you. And if you don't like to read, just listen to it. Just come and join the conversations and or just get an audible version of it. That's a really good thing to do. An audible version can help you just listen while you're working. I don't have to. Reading takes time. You have to sit, sit down. I'm the kind of person who will do that. Uh, but I like to I like audible because it lets me listen to a lot. And I just, that's just a love of mine. It's a habit. I just adore it. It changes my life. But in this book, Cast, what she does is she, she frames for us um, the journey of our nation in a different way. And here's what, what she, how she defines it. The word cast means a, a, a cast um, is something that is an artificial construction, a fixed and embedded ranking of human value that sets the presumed supremacy of one group against the presumed inferiority of other groups on the basis of their ancestry. Now, I'm going to get this, just hang with me for a minute. And often immutable traits, unchangeable traits. This means you can't change your color. It's immutable. Immutable traits, traits that would be neutral, hang with me, in the abstract, but are ascribed life and death meaning and hierarchy favoring, hang with me, the dominant caste. In other words, you tend to say, okay, everybody that's this color looks good, and everybody that's that color is not good. And you start drawing these hierarchical, 
um, a better than standards. Then he closes with this. A caste system was, uses rigid, often arbitrary boundaries to keep the ranked groupings apart, distinct from one another, and in their assigned places. All people that are skinny are good people, and all people that are fat are bad people. And all people that are tall, it's, just, it's arbitrary, it's made up, and it's designed to keep people apart. This happens in middle schools. It happens in school. It's, it's, it's the root of bullying. You know, you got big lips, you got big eyes. Who told you you got something that looks good? It's arbitrary. It's a, it's a caste system uses rigid, often arbitrary boundaries to keep the ranked groupings apart. Black people over here, white people over there, rich people over here, rich, poor people over there. This was really really seen in India, where it's part of the culture. And, and you, you can tell by their name, you can tell by their dress, you can tell by a number of different dynamics that you, this is a low caste, high caste. And it's, it's, it's just a whole historical thing that she goes through, which is so informative. And what she says is, prior to America, there was no black and white. People were not known by those races. They were known by European, or, or I, was, I was a Mexican, or I was a Brazilian, or I was a Portuguese. You, you, weren't, you weren't defined by black and white. But in America, when the melting pot happened and all those different countries came here, the light-skinned people all put on one side, dark-skinned people on the other side, and because of our birthmark, the darkness of our skin, that became a way to define us as a lower caste, and that became part of the system, and that became part of the basis. It is horrible to read. I told you, it's a hard history. It's a tough history. But we, as she says so beautifully, and I'm not going to quote that today, but she makes a quote about a house. She says, a house that was all built called America, and in that house there were leaky, leaky roofs and, and warped floors, and that's our house, whether we like it or not. And now we have inherited what our forefathers did, and we must understand the blame the fair, 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 fair summary of what happened. That's now our leaky roof they left us. That's now the racial gap that they left us. They did this. I'll tell you something that's even more profound. And I'm telling you, boy, it is uh, somewhere around chapter 7, 8-ish or so in her book. I can't recall, but she has a whole chapter on the way that the Germans came over to America and studied the Jim Crow laws and use those rules and laws as a basis for creating Nazism. They're biased toward races and the whole idea of segregating. America was the premier example of segregation around the world, and we were the, we were the most successful country. So they looked to see what America was doing, and since America thought it was okay, they took it to another place. But I'm just saying, it was amazing to me that this caste system, existed. Well, Pastor Rick, now let me understand. Now, you said all that. How did that fit in the word? Well, Acts chapter 10. Peter believed in a caste system. Jews up here, Gentiles down there. And, and in order for God to do his work in the world, he had to challenge the caste system. He had to, he had to dismantle it. Because without dismantling it, you wouldn't be reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you have to understand, you know, as a, a, and I see in here, most of you, you know that in every race, black, white, whatever race, there's a caste system. There's a young white girl who killed herself the other day because someone in her school attacked her and then put it on the internet. And she killed herself. Caste system. Doesn't always, doesn't always line up with just black people or white people. We all do. In our families, we do it. In our families, we, we, we mock each other if you prosper. We, 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 we do things sometimes that makes people feel less than. And in Acts chapter 10, God comes to Peter in a dream, in a vision, and he has this, this uh, sheet fall down uh, in front of him with animals, and he says, Peter, slay and eat. And Peter says, no, I don't eat anything that's common or unclean. Nothing that's common or unclean. But Jesus knew. God knew that there was no way that the world would be reached unless that was changed. And so Peter had to meet the right people to change that. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The importance of meeting the right people. People that can change and challenge 
your way of thinking. Without that, you'll be trapped in injustice. Peter would not change. but God sent Cornelius to have his servants go knock on the door and ask Peter to come to his house. He said, I want to talk to you. So Peter, chapter 10, verse 21, Peter went down and said to the men that came to his door, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, we've come from Cornelius, the, the centurion. That's a Roman soldier. He's a righteous and God-fearing man who was respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him, watch this, then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. Now I want you to notice this now. God sends somebody to Peter, the right people. Peter doesn't understand what's happening. But this is something that Peter would have never done on his own. He would not have ever gone to them. So God had to send the right people to him. Watch verse, the next verse here. Verse 25. The following day, he arrived. The next day, Peter started out with them. And some of the believers from Joppa went along. Then following, the following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. And Peter entered the house. Cornelius met him and fell on it at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up, stand up. He said, I'm only a man. Peter walks in, and he's stunned. These Gentiles have come for him. But please note, if he didn't go with these people, his whole life would have been different. And this is God breaking a yoke. What I like about it is Peter responded quickly. He goes the next day. He doesn't delay. And then verse 27 says, while talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. And he said to them, you're, you're well aware that it is against our law. Listen carefully. This is caste system. Against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. There's the caste system. We don't hang out. We don't have anything to do with that. Do you have a group of people like that in your life? You don't like people? I don't know what fits in your category. Is that who, 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 you don't like dumb people? Uneducated people, white people, Asian people? Who don't you like? It's amazing. But God showed me, Peter says, that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask, he said, why you sent for me? And then Cornelius recites the, the vision he had and how the angel came to him and said, go get Peter. And Peter was in Joppa. I think I got a picture of Joppa. I want to show you. This is the modern day Joppa. Now I believe we can show you. Joppa was a place that was a city not too far, about 30, 30 miles, 30 miles. That's modern day Joppa right there. And so he's in this city. He doesn't look like that at the time, believe me. And then he goes to Caesarea. Show him the next place he goes. He says, I want, you to, I want you to travel to Cornelius' house. And this is another. So these are both, both by the sea. And I want you to notice Peter makes this 30-mile journey. And when he makes this journey, I'll talk more about that next week, but there's this incredible thing that happens. But please notice, the right people can change your life. The right people, the right church, the right sermon, the right, the right approach can take your mind to a new place. And that's what God is doing. And what's really powerful is Peter was willing to go. He's willing to have his mind changed. He had to be willing to open his heart. Verse 44 says this, while Peter was still speaking, these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who, were, who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them all speak in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of them being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And he realized that there's no favoritism. He realized that God had a plan for them. You know, God has a plan for people who are not like you. I, I, um, I had an experience all of my life. I've been predominantly raised 
around black people. All my life, I had very little experience across cultural lines. It wasn't until college that I really got baptized in a new environment. I ended up going to predominantly white college. I was one of maybe two kids in the class that were black. That was it. It was only one black girl to date in the whole school. Maybe two. I can't think of three. And I know how it felt for the first time to be in the minority for real, up close, in an academic environment. And I remember I was working at a, uh, I got a job in Glendale, California at elementary school as a coach, part-time coach. All you do is, you know, take the kids through exercises and, you know, you had this little thing, you had, they gave you a list of things you had to do, teaching so many jumping jacks and all that. So I was up there and they used to call me Coach Temple. My wife, man, I didn't know that story, but Coach Temple. And I remember I was out there running around with them kids and I was the only black person running around with a bunch of white kids behind me. And I said, Jesus, how in the world did I get here? And I never will forget what came to my mind. You cannot minister to people you don't love. I can't use you across the lines if you can't love across the lines. And I mean really love. And there was something about that experience. I learned that I'm just as smart. I learned that crazy come in all colors. But I also learned my fears. I, 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 there were things I was afraid of. Can I tell you a story that's really real? You want to know, raise your hand. If you don't want to know, I ain't going to tell you. I don't see everybody. You want to know this is very personal. I never thought I couldn't date across lines. I never thought it, never, never was a conscious thought on my mind because I, I, my mother took me from here. I was part of the Great Migration, you know, from I think 1916 to 1970, six million African-Americans moved from the south. They moved up north, up to, up to um, they moved to New York area, middle of the country, in the west side in California. My family in 1964 was part of that migration. And I, I, I tell you, what's powerful was I never consciously understood segregation. Not really. I never saw one black sign. I never saw one black bathroom. I, never, I, I left. My mom made sure. She had this uh, canny ability to keep all that from me. Let me show you how, how un uninformed I was. I remember when Dr. Martin Luther King was shot. I was in the house. I was watching television. And I remember the guy who said it. They said they shot King. And I remember as a kid saying, who was King? I remember asking that question. And I remember he walked out the door, man, that's when they had the big riots in L.A. And he was, I guess he was going to be part of the riot, but I remember that moment. There, there was something about my naivety. I, I didn't understand that there was a caste system because I was picked up by my mom and kept away from the fire of it, the pain of it. But I remember somehow in my soul, something had a wall up. I had a, and so when I was in this college environment, I remember there was a girl who, I guess she liked me. I don't know. But I remember, but she said, she said something, we were walking between the buildings. And I remember she said, we're finally alone. And she had that look on her face. And I remember I said these words, no, we're not. And I ran. I took off like you couldn't believe. Boy, I was running like a bus. I don't know why I'm running, but I'm running from this. I'm not. And I learned later, are you afraid of this? What made you afraid? She didn't do anything to you. What made you afraid? Somewhere in my culture, somewhere in my head, I, I had the caste system thing. And then God sent me to a predominantly white church. I remember I raised my hand. It was a big church, too. It had thousands of members. I raised my hand, and... Um, it wasn't no black hands. It's all, it's all like a big it's vanilla. <laughs> I remember how I felt. All around me. Every seat. And then I remember, you know, there's always one black person on staff, so I remember I migrated to this person. 
And I remember they, they used to always pray when you graduated. You prayed for the person, you know, who was leaving, at, you know, town and graduating. And, and I used to always sit there in the audience and watch, you know, their day was coming. Their day was, uh, I'm going to move to Alabama. I'm not Alabama. I'm going to uh, uh, Korea or someplace, you know, some fancy place. I'm going to Israel. I'm going to, to Africa and be a missionary. And I used to always, you know, admire that. And I remember when I got ready to graduate, and I put my name in there and said, hey, you know, I'm going to get prayed for on the stage, too, because I'm leaving, going to the south, praise God. And they put my name in, but they forgot me. And I remember sitting in the church, you know, and waiting, and he dismissing. So I ran up to the guy. I said, hey, what happened? He said, oh, man. Then he went to the pastor and said, oh, man, Wow. Elders, you, you, come here. Pray for him over here. And they put me, I didn't even like the prayer. <laughs> I wasn't even into the prayer that time. I said, I'm glad I got an attitude here. This is injustice here. You know, and pray for all the white people on the stage. You ain't praying for me. But in the corner, what kind of prayer is this? <laughs> fast forward, fast forward, fast forward. Church, is, church grows, go into ministries, things start happening, God blesses the church. And, and I become this guy that is asked to speak at all the big conferences, all the big conventions. And I would, I would say I'm given their highest honor, the honorary doctorate of divinity degree from the denomination. That they, that in the denomination is called the International Church of the Foursquare Gospel. I'm still licensed with them. I carry a dual license our denomination and, and, and um, our, our corporation and, and that their denomination. And I remember they gave me at 38 their highest honor. Highest honor. Everybody on the stage was in their 60s. God may not get you there the way you plan to get there, but he'll get you there. Amen. Come on, say amen. You hear me? Now catch this. I'm going to go a little further. I'm, boy, I got to finish. Can you give me another extra five minutes? Can you do it? Hang with me. So fast forward, 2011, they get in trouble. And they call me and they ask me would I move to L.A. to take over the church. The church on the way is called. Would I, would I help? I said, well, I, I'm not going to just leave Savannah. Savannah hasn't done anything to me. So I said, um, I'm not doing that. I said, but I'll help you if I can. And so I, if for three years, I was pastoring both churches by coastal. But let me tell you a powerful moment. They had a chapel, the place that they were meeting in when I left, when I was there, was a chapel. It may have seated, I don't know, we, they had about 6,000 members, but they had 20,000 services. I mean, but I remember the, the chapel. I had been in the chapel since they prayed for me in the corner. Years had gone by since I'd been in the chapel. I used to come back to the church and preach, but I had never walked foot in the chapel. But I walked in as the pastor of the church, the man in charge of all of it, 8,000 Spanish, 3,000 English people, and I'm over everything. Black man walking in the room with lovingly said a wonderful assistant guy, and I walked in the chapel, and I froze. And something came on me. Look what God has done. Come on, say amen, somebody. Look at how God, look at, look at how God, how God can, can work things out for you. Look at how God can lift you up. I'm telling you, see, sometimes you're waiting. And I remember, he said, what's wrong with you? I said, I need a minute. I need a minute. I need a minute. I need a minute. The last time I was in here, I was in the corner with an attitude while they were praying for me. Oh, come on, somebody. But God said, just hold on, son. I'll bless you. You don't have to get it the way you think you're going to get justice, but God will give you justice. Come on, somebody. You hear what I'm saying to you? And they, let me say something. I'm going to say that you take this right. You take what I'm about to say right. They love me. And they really wanted me to stay now. They really did. They really did. And one Sunday, I was so overwhelmed because I was doing both churches, and I sat down on the pulpit, and I said, y'all know I'm black, right? They said, we don't care. Yes, they did. They yelled back. We don't care that you're black. See, God has a way 
of raising you up and giving you gifts and anointing your life. You are just as good as anybody else if you have a chance. Come on, say amen if you're hearing me. You're just as good as anybody else. Hallelujah. Come on, say amen. Hallelujah. I got more to say, but just read the notes. Hallelujah. Let's stand on your feet. Come on, I got to get y'all out of here. Father, you are good. You knew about the injustice. But you had a plan. The key was for me to be faithful and loving and forgiving. We've had a tough journey in this country. But some of us were not willing to travel the distance to get free. Peter had to travel a distance, and next week we'll talk about the distance you got to travel. It's not around the corner sometimes. It's a few books down the road, a few classes down the road, maybe a degree down the road. But whatever the distance is, Father, we want your will. You'll get us to justice. We just got to have the right people in our lives and the right attitude. And so I give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, I pray for those who don't know your Savior. I pray that what we, what we talked about today would touch them in a way that they realize they need you in their life. You make the difference. You are the healer. And so I pray for them today that they would open their hearts to you to receive you. May this be the moment that you bring grace and healing to their life. May they say, Jesus, be the Lord of my life from this moment forward. And we give you all the praise and we give you all the glory in the name above all names. Everyone say amen. If you know, you don't know, you want, your prayer was for you today. You said, Pastor Rick, what you said spoke to me. What would be just for me to do is to give Jesus a chance in my life. You may have not been fair to God. You're talking about who's not been fair to you. Have you been fair to God is the question. With every head bowed one more last time, you said, Pastor, I want to, I want to make a declaration. I'm, I'm surrendering my life to God today. And I want you to pray one last prayer for me. Anybody said, that's me. The just thing to do would be to say, God, you're worthy of my life. I surrender my life to you for real today. Raise your hand. Anybody say, that's me. That's me. I see you. Anybody else say, pray for me. I see you. I see you. Anybody else? The just thing to do. I see you. He's been so good to you. Why not? Why doesn't he have you in his life? Why aren't you in his life? Why aren't you allowing God to rule in your life? If you're watching today, it's your, it's your opportunity to say, you know, I'm talking about somebody else's injustice. What about me? What about me? Have I been fair to God? Father, let this be that moment they, they are fair to you and say, you deserve my life. And I come to you and I surrender my life to you in the name that's above every name. And everyone say amen.